Okay, uh, welcome back to the main track. Next on our stage, we have Septak uh, with us. He contributed to many open source projects uh, like accessibility, uh, the, uh, the accessibility project and uh, Onion Share and uh, Wacto. Uh, he's here today to share his knowledge about the famous Python framework Django, especially on added security headers to your application. Uh, security headers uh, play a crucial role in defending your website and ensuring the safety of your users. So uh, prepare to dive into different security headers and learn how to integrate them with Django. Uh, to follow along, please check our, uh, or even contribute to the share notes uh, link in, uh, on the official CoSCAP website. Uh, you can just check the link on the official website and uh, you will find a link to the share note, also another link to the Slido today. So if you have any question, please leave it on the slide though. We will use that later. Okay, so uh, I'll give, my, uh, give the time to uh, Seb Tuck. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yep, great. Okay, so in the slide I also have a link if you want to follow along or if you want to keep it so that you can like check it later on, you can do that. Um, today we are going to talk about does your Django application have security headers? Who am I? I'm a self-proclaimed human rights-centered developer, which means I work more on security, accessibility, and privacy kind of stuff. I am also a maintainer and contributor to different open source projects like OnionShare, Ally Project, and Wagtail. I also authored the security and accessibility chapter in Web Almanac 2022. Now, before we get started on how to add security headers, let's talk, like, let's break down the title a little bit for people who might not be sure. Um, so what's Django firstly? Django is an open source batteries included Python web framework. What I mean by that is unlike many other Python web frameworks, Django already has a lot of things included in it. So if you need databases, if you need um, like any kind of ORM and things like that, they already have that unlike many other frameworks. And as we will see, it also already has a lot of the security features to add the security headers that we are going to talk about. What are headers? What do I mean by headers? When I say headers, I mean HTTP headers. So what are HTTP headers? So HTTP headers are whenever you are sending a request when to a website, like let's say, for example, if you're going to coscop.org, so what happens is some request headers are sent to the server, and that request header basically gives information about the client, like these are the things that we are expecting, and the response header comes, when the response comes from the server, it has some response headers in it. So for example, if we go to the Coscop website itself, and like in any browser, you can do inspect element, and if you go to the network tabs, do a control shift r and do this i'm not sure if it's visible but you will see like any website you go there will have this response header section which has a lot of different things and then also it has like a request header section which again has a lot of different things not really important in what they are we will get into that a little bit later so usually the syntax is like it has a header name, colon, and then the value. And the value depends on the security headers. It may consist of directives. It may consist of other things. What I mean by security headers are HTTP headers sent in the response. So specifically the response HTTP headers. And they inform the browser about various security features. So it, a website can tell the browser like, look, these are the things you should be doing. You should not be tracking the user. You should not send this information about the user and things like that. So that's why we need security headers. It helps in um, maintaining the privacy and the security and also many other things like encrypting the data and all. So with that out of the way, this is a website where you can actually check for security headers. So let's say you already have a website built, right? For example, it may be coscup.org. And it doesn't need to be a Django project. Any website you have with an URL, so you can go to securityheaders.com. And then if you paste the link to your website in that and do a scan, it will give you a grade. And I mean, yeah, it's nice to look at. Like if you want to show your product team, like, oh yeah, I have made my website really secure. You can show this very green A color, or if you get an F, they have a very red F. 
But what is more important is they also give you a lot of information about the security headers, what are the things you need to add, what does those things mean, and things like that. So the first thing that helps us add security headers in a Django application is Django security middleware itself. Um, anyone who has created a Django application, you might have used a Django startup command. So you do some command line saying Django startup and then you create a project. When you do that, or even when you clone most of the repositories that are written in Django, you will see actually this header is like this middleware is already present. So this is something you see when you do Django admin start project my site. If you go to the my site slash settings.py, you will see a middleware section which has a list. And it has a list of different middlewares. You can create your own middleware, add them. There are different ordering and things like that. You can learn about middleware more in the link there. Um, so the very first middleware, if you see, is the security middleware. So it gets added automatically if you are using the Django admin start project thing. But also, if you clone most Django projects, and if you do a security middleware search, you will see that it's mostly present. It's recommended not to remove. Now, what does this security middleware help us in? Like, why is that middleware even there? So it helps us actually add a lot of the security headers. So once you have the middleware, you already have a lot of different variables present to you in security, uh, the settings.py file. And once you set them to some particular values, that helps you return a security response header. So the first very important security header is strict transport security. So strict transport security is a HTTP response header. So what it says is, so there are two different kind of protocols, HTTP and HTTPS. HTTPS is the encrypted protocol. So if you send a request via HTTP, then basically, if someone is sitting in between your connection, let's say you are also on a Wi-Fi, I'm also on a Wi-Fi, and somehow I have access to all your requests. If it's an HTTP request, I can see every data that you are sending or getting back. So let's say if you are using HTTP to log in to some website, I can actually see your password, because the password is not going encrypted. HTTPS, however, everything goes as an encrypted data. So you should always be using HTTPS. But what this header does is not add the HTTPS part. That's a different setting. What it says as a response header is, if my website, someone is accessing over HTTP, don't allow that. Always make them go through HTTPS. So it's kind of like a redirect, but not really. So if because of this header, what will happen is even if they go through HTTP, they will be redirected to HTTPS. So they will never, ever be able to do an unencrypted request, right? So that helps, like, even if they forget, and sometimes if you forget to do a redirection in your website, it helps to always maintain an encrypted connection. And why is this, like, header good to use? Um, this is a statistics from the last year's Almanac. Almost 89% websites requests now have a like HTTPS, it's served over HTTPS. So, I mean, yeah, you should probably be adding, and hopefully this number gets better also in the future. So the strict transport security header has few different values or directives, you can say. The first one is max h. So what the max h says is, in seconds, it will tell you that to remember for this many seconds, always use an encrypted connection. So always use HTTPS for at least, let's say, 30 seconds, if you mention 30. Include subdomains, so your website URL can have subdomains. So let's say coscup.org, but also it can be blog.coscup.org, right? So if you mention include subdomains directive, what will happen is not only will this header be present in coscup.org, it will also be present in blog.coscup.org. And there is also a, another directive called preload. What happens is Google maintains this HSTS preload list, and most browsers import that. So if you tell your website to also send a preload, it will be like listed in this list. So whenever, like, your browser will automatically know. Like, it won't even need the first response header to know that it has to go through an HTTPS connection. It will automatically load an HTTPS connection because it is present in the HSTS list. 
It's not part of the standards, really, so it's your choice, but the first two are very important. Now, how to add them in Django? So when you have the security middleware that we talked about, Django gives you a variable called secure underscore HSTS underscore seconds. So when you set this variable secure underscore HSTS underscore seconds to any non-zero integer, what it will do is it will set that max edge variable in the security header. So for example, if you do secure underscore HSTS underscore second equals to 3600, what it will do is it will set a max edge equals to this, right? The other one is secure underscore HSTS underscore include underscore subdomains. So it's corresponding to the include subdomains directive. So it takes a true or false value. You can decide if you want your subdomains to also have this HSTS directive. So if you want, it's always a good idea to set it to true so that, you know, sometimes it will be like, okay, the website, for example, example.com is already in HTTPS, but you forgot to put it in like, let's say login.example.com and then the issue still stays because then that place is going through an unencrypted connection. So it's good to have include subdomain set to true if you want. And then similarly, you also have a secure underscore HSTS underscore preload that sets the preload directive. The next security header is referrer policy. So what a referrer policy does is there is another HTTPS request header called referrer. And for some reason, one has two Rs and another has one R, but they are kind of similar things. So what the referrer policy says is whenever you are sending a request, let's say you are in coscop.org and then you want to go to djangoproject.com, for example, the, when you go from coscop.org to djangoproject.com, a referrer HTTP request header is set to coscop.org which allows Django project to know where the user is coming from. Now, let's say if you don't want that, if you don't want other websites to know where your user is coming from because you don't, because the other website could be using that information, right? You don't know if an user is clicking a malicious link and they might be using that information and then exploiting it somehow. So most of the times for privacy reasons, you might not be wanting, wanting to set this header. So what you can do is you can send a response header called referrer policy. And based on that, like it has different values and based on that, it will decide when to send this referrer HTTP request header and when to not. So a very important thing to discuss before we get onto the different values is origin. What do I mean by the word origin? Because it will come again and again. Um, so origin is if you have an URL, for example, example.com slash app one slash index.html, then origin is the scheme, the host name, and the port of the URL. Okay. So it's https colon example.com, for example. But if it was on let's say 8080 port, so it would be https colon example.com colon 8080, right? So there are two different things, same origin and cross origin. These are used in security and security headers a lot. What is same origin? So if two URLs have the origin parts same, so for example, HTTPS example.com app one index.html and then there is app two index.html, but the example.com part stays same. So that's considered as same origin. But let's say if you are going from example.com to a different .com, even the path is same or whatever, as long as the origin part gets different, so it's called cross origin. So it's very important to understand. And that's why, so for example, all the pages in example.com are probably maintained by the same person, right? So you can decide as long as they are in my website. For example, if the Coscop organization can decide that if they're all in coscop.org, we will allow everything. But if they go outside coscop.org, we don't want to send any information. So based on that, there is this referrer policy directives. So the referrer policy header can have these values which are mentioned in the leftmost column. And from bottom to top, it becomes more secure. So what the first directive is no referrer. So what it means is for any origin, I will never ever send a referrer header. So if you set it to no referrer, that's the most strictest security header that you can set so that never will I ever send the information of the user. The second one is no referrer when downgrade. 
So what does protocol downgrade mean? Protocol downgrade means if your connection for some reason goes from HTTPS to HTTP, right? So if you are in the same URL, but for some reason you are going from HTTPS colon example dot com to some HTTP colon example dot com, in that case we won't be sending the referral header. Otherwise I can send. So that's what this no referral header when downgrade means. Similarly goes for origin. So when you mention directive as origin, what it does is if origin is there, then we will send the referrer header. But it, like we will send only the origin part of the URL basically, just the example.com. So they will know that they are coming from this particular website, but they won't know um, which part path of the website they are coming from. And then the next one is origin when cross origin. So if it's same origin, I will be sending the full URL, but if it's cross origin, then I send only the origin part of the URL. Then comes same origin. So what it means is if there is same origin, so it's going from within the same web website, but in a different path, then you share the full URL. Strict origin means you always do only origin. You never do like full URL ever. Strict origin when cross origin again means something like you will do origin when it's cross origin, else you will send a full URL. And unsafe URL basically means you send all the information every time, doesn't matter. So similarly, like before Django, again, the security middleware, as long as you have that middleware, you can set this secure underscore refer underscore policy variable. Um, so basically what you need to do is you need to set that to any of these directives. So once you set them to any of those directives, the referral policy header will uh, show the same directive. So default value is same origin, so it's not the most secure, but it's also not as bad as unsafe URL. So yeah, strictest value is no referrer, so always recommended to set no referrer so that none of the information about your user goes out. The next security header is X content type options. So what it does is it tells the browser that, um, so let's say it's uh, the browser is telling that um, I want a content type text slash HTML website. So it will always only accept requests if it's coming the response as a text slash HTML. So if it's the response for some reason comes a JavaScript file, they will immediately ignore it and not serve it. So it's important so that like for some reason if the server is a malicious server that you are going to and they are trying to send you a different kind of file, it helps in that. So setting X content type options will allow you to do that. So the setting, uh, so what happens is there is only one variable in Django security headers called secure content type no sniff. So basically, X content type options can only have one value, which is no sniff. So if you set this to true, then it gets set. If you don't set it or set it to false, then this header just doesn't get set. Now there is another middleware also, which is present called click jacking protection. So what this middleware does is it, um, it ensures that if someone is embedding your website. Let's say there is an iframe tag, and inside that iframe tag, they are loading your website. Uh, so there are attacks which can, like if you click on anything within the iframe, so based on that, a malicious website can create attacks on the user. So it kind of prevents that kind of attacks. So this is also present in the default middleware list, actually. So if you see the last very option that has the click jacking middleware, so that's why Django already has a lot of the security features that we need. And the middlewares always get present, but oftentimes the settings.py file won't have the variables set. So you still need to set the variables so that the security headers are set. So this middleware, again, allows us to set this XFrame options header. So XFrame options, again, does something very similar that if it's present in an iframe, will I allow any information about the user or not? So it has a value called deny uh, or same origin. So there are two different values possible. So by default, if the middleware is included, the value is always set to deny. So that's good actually, because deny is the most secure like header that you can have. So if it's deny, it basically says 
the page cannot be rendered in a frame. So it just doesn't allow you to render the frame at all. So anyone, if they even try to do iframe, they can't do your website iframe, which completely prevents the click jacking attacks. But if you mention it as same origin, well, if you know that your website only will be using it as an iframe, like you are using iframes to show different parts in your own website, then you can set it to same origin and then they will allow you to do iframe if it's in the same origin. If it's not in the same origin, then they won't allow the iframe to be loaded. This is a separate package. So this doesn't come with Django. So you have to install this separately. It's called Django CSP. So CSP stands for Content Security Policy. And Content Security Policy is a very like vast topic. It's a, like, it has many different values possible. And it prevents a lot of different kind of securities. So if we want to talk about all the different kind of content security policy, that's going to be a complete separate talk altogether. So we won't be discussing all the directives that's present because there are many. But what it does is different kind of content security policy tells the browser what kind of content can be loaded and where are the contents loaded allowed from. So let's say, for example, if you want to have a Twitter embed, but you can mention if your website should be allowed to have a Twitter embed or not. So it kind of prevents XSS attacks, basically, right? So if someone, if you are taking comments, for example, right? So if your website has a comment section and someone added some script in the comment section and you haven't sanitized your HTML properly, so this content security policy will ensure that if that comment section, the script, or the XSS attack, tries to load some malicious website, as long as their content security policy is strict enough, it won't be loaded at all. So to add to Django, once you have installed Django CSP, you just need to add this middleware, csp.middleware.csp middleware. And once you have that, there are different policies that you can add. And it's a lot. So again, I won't go into depth, but if you are not confident, so content security policy can be really breaking your website because um, since it's not allowing you to load, even things that you might be thinking of loading might not get loaded because you don't know where you have embedded things in your website. So if you're not very sure, you can start with something called content security policy report only. So what that does is it won't stop your website from loading, but it will report the websites to a URL that you send them to. So that's a good place to start from. Each policy in content security policy consists of a name and a value. The value can be self, which is the most strict. So basically, anything that is in my website only, that's allowed. Nothing else is allowed. It can, be, and when I say nothing else, it also means like inline scripts, right? So which is how a lot of the attacks will happen accesses. So they won't allow if someone press, puts like a script tag and puts a message. It will only allow if a script.js is loaded from the same origin. You can have nonce. What is nonce is um, you can mention some text in your script tag and then also mention that like text generated in your content security policy and then it ensures that that script tag is loaded. Or you can do a generate a SHA-256 hash of your script and then put that also in the content security policy and then it will ensure only that inline script is loaded, nothing else will be loaded. Or it can have links. So what does link help is if you want a Twitter embed or if you want a YouTube embed. So the link ensures that those get loaded. If you try to do a YouTube embed but in your script policy, like script source, you don't have YouTube.com, then it might not get loaded. Or if it's a frame, and you don't have it mentioned in frame source, it might not get loaded. The self keyword is usually the most secure one. There are different common policies called default source, script source, image source, media source, form action. Default source is like a general script that you say, like by default, always only load self. Don't load from anywhere else, any kind of resource. Style source says where your CSS files can be loaded, script sources where your JavaScript files can be loaded, image source, media source, similar. Form action is another interesting thing which says like where a form can be submitted into. So if you are, let's say, using some MailChimp or something like that, so you can ensure that only forms to MailChimp can be 
added to, and you mentioned that URL, and nowhere else can a form submit form be submitted. How to use Django CSP? So to use Django CSP, you will add, for example, if you want to add script source, once you have that middleware, it basically is like CSP underscore script underscore source, and then it's a list or a tuple. So in the list or the tuple, you can mention the different sources from where you are allowing the scripts to be loaded. So for example, here we have self, so anything from the website itself can be loaded. Platform.twitter.com means any Twitter embed can be loaded. And a shaft 256, which probably says like only this particular inline script can be loaded. They also have some unsafe inline and unsafe eval kind of variables. They are not recommended to be used, but sometimes you might not have any other option, in which case unsafe if inline basically just says load any kind of inline script. Please try to avoid doing that. Then like the meaning is lost. OK, so these are the references. Um, it has all the links that I have used. You can read through a lot more of them. There are a lot more details there. And yeah, thanks. These are the links to my websites. If you want to contact me on IRC, I'm there as well. Thank you. OK, any question? No, Leng, I have a question. Uh, uh, si since all the header is trying to control the browser behavior, right? right. So uh, it seems that you, you can just override the setting, setting as a user uh, by uh, maybe a, a extension in your browser, right? So, huh? yeah, I mean, there are some Chrome extensions and browser extensions which also allow you to modify how you uh, like handle the website. But these are response headers, right? So there is request header and response header. So what the client can modify usually is the request header. So they can send what kind of headers are sent to the server. But what headers are sent to the client is controlled by the server. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, you can have extensions to override them and things like that. But yeah, most uh, actually, I'm trying to ask that if you uh, recommend uh, recommend uh, you if you have a recommendation on any extension that can protect us as a user, since that uh, may maybe sometimes the server side right. will not protect you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there are some privacy kind of extensions, but like privacy badger, which is maintained by EFF. So that does like a lot of prevents a lot of tracking. So if they see like okay this website, let's say for example, for some reason Amazon AWS dot com is trying to be loaded, it will say don't load it. So that's kind of like a extension, but it doesn't really add a security header to the response itself. It's more like they can try to detect what are the different things the website itself is trying to load and then say, okay, let's say if Google is evil and they are trying to load Google Analytics, they can say, never load Google Analytics because we don't want our users to be tracked. So that kind of extension is present, but it can't just override the response header that Google sent to the browser. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other question? No? Then let's thank, thank you again. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>